So I now have the pleasure of introducing Jennifer. Jennifer Woods is a livestock handling specialist based out of Blackie, Alberta. Jennifer obtained her undergrad degree in animal science at Colorado State University and her master's degree in veterinary preventative medicine from Iowa State University. Jennifer has over 25 years experience in the livestock industry and has worked as a consultant to the industry since 1998. Jennifer's work has taken her all over North America, across Europe, down to Australia. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Jennifer. Thank you, Robin. Are we... Perfect, I can now see your screen, Jennifer. Okay, there we go. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with me, just add to the little bit of bio um, that Robin did with me. I am actually a sheep producer myself. So my family and I do run a flock of purebred South Down sheep. Uh, and my son has some commercial 4-H cheese that he runs also. So we just, just finished our lambing the February 1st. So it was a very cold winter for it. So today I'm going to cover sheep handling and behavior, and I titled this program "Why Sheep Do What They Do and Not What We Want Them to Do." Because people ask me all the time, "Why did it do that?" or "Why doesn't it do this?" or "They're so hard to handle." And actually, I believe sheep are one of the easiest animals to handle uh, if you understand them. So. And the majority of animals actually do, I tell people this all the time, an animal does exactly what you told it to do. It did it based on where you're standing, how you're moving, how you're reacting, and how you're communicating to them. So normally when they do something we don't want them to do, it is often because of what we did. So we'll go ahead and get started. There we go. Okay. Fact check. I actually had this said to me just this weekend when I was doing a livestock handling for youth presentation, um, a comment about that sheep are stupid. And I'm like, actually sheep are not. And science can back it up. So um, sheep are not a stupid animal at all. So um, I got a couple stories here on, on sheep. This one is from um, over in Europe. But they taught themselves to actually roll eight feet across a cattle guard, so like a Texas gate, to raid the villagers' garden. So according to a witness there, they lie down on their side or sometimes they're back and just roll over and over the grids until they are clear. Um, it, it does answer how my sheep have probably got somewhere places I, I haven't thought they could. So we do have our animals end up places they don't, and this is obviously one reason, one way they do it. Now, a study um, of sheep psychology has found a man's woolly friend can remember the faces of more than 50 other sheep for up to two years, and they can recognize a familiar human face. Now, they are way better at this than cattle are. There has been research done in cattle, and it was very limited when they had facial recognition, but sheep are actually able to remember not just the man, but other sheep for up to two years. So they form individual friendships with one another also. And it's possible they may think about a face even when it's not there. So, and interesting little tidbit to it. The researchers also found that female sheep had a definite opinion of what makes a ram's face attractive. So, and according to researchers in Australia, sheep can learn and remember. Uh, researchers have developed a complex maze test to measure intelligence and learning in sheep. Uh, they concluded that sheep have actual, uh, actual, eh, excellent memory and are able to learn and improve their performance, and they can retain this information for a six-week period. There was another research project done. It was actually a cattle-based project that used sheep, um, and it had to do with a maze also. And they were quite amazed at how quickly the sheep learned, much faster than the cattle did on the maze. So. So sheep are actually smarter than, than people often give them credit for. So they also are self-medicating. Uh, there has been research that has shown that sick sheep can actually be smart enough to cure themselves. So they will actually seek out plants that make them feel better. So there's been previous evidence to suggest that animals can detect what nutrients they're deficient in. And we do see this in mineral deficiency and licking the ground or licking rocks and stuff. 
but um, this research project was actually based on sheep finding out plants that would make them better. So now I'm gonna start with sheep behavior. When um, I do handling and behavior with any of the species groups, I spend a lot of time talking about behavior and getting people to understand the animals themselves because to me, handling is 90% ha understanding behavior. Once you understand their behavior, you will be able to handle them effectively. When people don't understand animal or sheep behavior, that's when they run into problems because so often people try to handle sheep like we handle people and it just doesn't work. So uh, like all grazing species, uh, sheep are prey animals. So we are predators. We spend our life hunting. They spend their life being hunted. Um, it makes everything about us different. It makes the way we think, the way we at, react, um, our social structure, just about everything about us is different. Now, prey animals do have two main motivators, and those are food and fear, I believe. And the theory behind this for me is because those are the two things they actually need to survive. They need food to survive, and they need to be fearful in order to protect themselves from their predators. If you understand these two main motivators, you can actually utilize them to get sheep to cooperate and do what you want them to do. But these are the main two things they always focus on. And food is really, really important to sheep. <laughs> A lot of times they'll let themselves get into bad situations because food often all overrides fear also. So animals do not think they react. What does that mean? That means they are truly living in the moment. They are reacting to whatever is happening at that given time around them. So they don't plot out ahead of time what they are going to do to us in the morning, as much as we'd like to believe they do. They do not plan for days what they're gonna do that week. On Monday, I'm gonna do this. On Tuesday, I'm gonna do this. They actually are truly living in the moment and they are continually reacting to what is going on around them. So if they're reacting to what they see, what they hear, what they feel, what they smell, even what they taste. So their senses brings the reaction about in their mind and that's, um, so they think differently than we do. So, and I just love these pictures. I'm sure there's people, right now who have had the bucket on the head, the sheep in the feeder. Not sure if any of you have ever had one up a power pole, but um, they get themselves in into quite the situations. They have two wild instincts. <clears throat> that is to flee or to fight. And this is a survival mechanism. Um, normally livestock will flee, especially sheep. They just clear out. They are not normal fighters. So they usually do not go on the attack. Um, I don't know if anybody read the article this morning um, about the sheep that attacked a lady and two kids from a daycare. Um, it was a vicious attack by a sheep and they're okay, but it just kind of made me laugh a little because you normally do not see sheep uh, come out, his name was Moses, um, and go after people like that. So they are normally fight animals. They just clear out there. Normally the only time they fight is uh, when they cannot flee and they will only fight until they can flee. So you do have aggressive behavior in rams, of course. Ewes can get protective of, of their young also. So if they feel threatened, they will. But their normal reaction is to flee. Now when sheep are threatened, they will usually turn and face the threat, then flee as a flock. So prey animals always want to see the predator. So they always turn, look at the at the threat and then they flee. And they usually do go as a flock. It's usually not an individual. That's a difference between them and goats. Uh, goats actually will spread out and, and go as individuals where sheep just pile up and go as a group. So they're a little different in that way. And then once they get safely away from the predator that they feel is a safe distance, then they actually stop, turn around and start watching the predator again so they know where they are. They have a very strong herd instinct. <clears throat> They have a stronger herd instinct than just about any other of the species groups. Ones who would give them a run for their money would probably be chickens, but sheep have an extremely strong herd instinct. So um, isolation is a very big stressor of the, this is all part though of being a prey animals. Predators hang out individually. 
prey animals hang out in groups. That's why you never hear of like a flock of bears or a herd of cougars. Predators will go off by themselves, where prey animals for safety reason and survival will stay in a group. So they do have a very strong herd instinct, which can work to your benefit. Usually with sheep, if you get one going, everybody goes. They do everything as a group. Uh, but there's times when you're trying to break them up, maybe work them in smaller groups, bring individual out, individuals out, that their strong herd instinct actually becomes quite challenging. The other thing about their strong herd instinct is they can pile. When they get very scared, they actually pile on top of each other. And you can lose animals from that too. Like if they, they're being really harassed by a coyote or a predator or something, they get to the corner of the fence or the corner of the barn, they just keep piling and piling and piling and you can lose the animals because of that piling mentality. You can see it sometimes during transportation too. So it's like a little too strong of a herd instinct. Trying to work an individual animal and sort out an individual animal is extremely difficult. I always tell people, if you want to get one animal in, it's a lot easier to bring three in instead of bringing just the one in. So this causes stress in them more than anything else is isolation. And it's because once again, they're a prey animal and it makes them very vulnerable. So they want that protection, but sheep are very, very active uh, to being singled out. Their strong herd instinct though, um, also can work to your advantage. This is a, a Judah sheep or a lead sheep. This is actually out of a plant. Um, and they use the sheep, they all have their bells on their neck and they actually load and unload uh, the animals. So when the trailer arrives at the plant, these animals go onto the trailer and they get the sheep on the trailer and they bring them out and take them to their pen and then they come out of their pen and they go back and get the next group. This also happens at farms. Um, I worked on a, a lamb feedlot and lambed out 5,000 ewes in three months. And when they bring the sheep in, this is how they would load also was with the lead sheep. So the lead sheep would take the group and lead them up into the, the semi, leave them in their compartment. They would stay and the lead sheep would come off which to me speaks to their intelligence also that you can train these animals to do this. These animals, this is their job at the plant is to move other sheep around and they know when to leave them and the other animals know when to stay. So it's an amazing thing, but it's usually using that herd instinct. Now, some things sheep do not like to do. They do not like walking downhill. They do not prefer to walk on wet surfaces. They do not like changes in footing and they do not like walk, walking towards solid walls. So they basically prefer flat, dry ground where they can see forever. So though all of us probably somewhere have downhill, we do here, surfaces will get wet. There are changes in footing. And if there's a solid wall in front of them, each of these things can make them balk. But if you're aware of this, you can help work them around it and either manage it or eliminate it. Sheep have a pretty big range of vision. Uh, it's almost completely around them. Uh, they have monocular vision off to the side and binocular vision to the front. So as a grazing species, they were created with an elongated head with their eyes on the side of their heads and up towards the top. And why they have this eye placement is because they spend 50 to 70% of their day with their head down grazing. This allows them to be able to graze along and still monitor with one eye that they're traveling with their flock still and the other eye that the big bad wolf isn't gonna come get them. So they're able to watch what's going on around them. As you can see in the bottom diagram, they have very wide angle vision with, with their head down uh, grazing. So they're continually able to watch, but this gives them something called monocular vision. This means their eyes work independent of each other. So their brain actually, their eyes watch two separate pictures and their brain is actually able to process the pictures coming in from both sides. We have binocular vision, which sheep had very limited binocular out front where their eyes work together, but our eyes work in tandem and our brain only processes one picture from two eyes, where sheep, their brain processes a picture from each eyes. And why does this matter? It matters because when you have monocular vision, you have very poor depth perception, especially with your head up. So they have a hard time judging distance 
and depth. So they can, if there's a shadow on the ground, they have a hard time determining if that shadow is flat to the ground or if it's a hole they're gonna fall into. If there's a puddle of water in front of them, they can't tell how deep that puddle is. They have to stop and drop their head to determine their, the depth. Very similar to what cattle do also. The difference with sheep though, is sheep, when they're standing still with their head up, they actually do have some depth perception. But as soon as they begin to move, they lose their depth perception. And that's why shadowing is so bad in, in, in facilities and stuff. I always talk about um, the use of this depth perception to control animal movement. And if you've ever been down to Texas, they actually paint the cattle guards or the Texas gates on the roads down there. So you'll be down there and you'll see Texas gates painted the white stripe, black asphalt, white stripe, black asphalt on, on and off ramps why they do this and how it keeps cattle from wandering onto the highway as long as they're not spooked is because the stripe of black asphalt between the two white stripes actually looks like a hole to them because of their poor depth perception so they don't want to step over it actually looks like a true uh texas gator cattle guard to them so one thing that does influence the range of vision of sheep is the amount of wool on their head so the sheep, like the one in this picture here that's looking at us, has a significant amount of wool around its head. This will limit their vision significantly because the wool blocks basically everything behind them. So you may have to handle your animals differently when they're in full wool, if they have a lot of wool around their head like this, than when they are not in full wool, because you are going to have to get into their range of vision. In order to do this, it needs to be past that wool. So just keep that in mind. So um, they will stop and focus in. This picture here, that's my son when he was little, but uh, this ram, we're, we're at a show. And um, it's, it's an interesting picture I took it because you can see the ram is focused in, but they will stop and focus in on one eye when they're trying to uh, get detail on things. Uh, this picture here, these sheep don't want to come out. You can see there's a ramp for them to come out, but they're stopping and they're basically trying to determine the depth of the jump they're going to make. And then sheep being sheep don't actually walk down the ramp, they jump. So that's just a sheep thing. A lot of times when sheep do jump, they're jumping over a shadow. They're jumping over something they cannot determine the depth of. Even when they're coming off of unloading ramps, when you're watching them run off of unloading ramps, you will often see them jump. And it can, they're probably jumping over the transition between the bottom of the unloading ramp and, and the, uh, the ground. So a lot of times when they are jumping, they are jumping over something that they aren't quite sure what it is or how to determine the depth of it. So now a little bit on handling. So what are our handling techniques? So probably the most reproduced piece of livestock handling literature is the flight zone. And for those of you who know Dr. Temple Grandin, uh, Temple is who coined this phrase and used it uh, to describe a livestock handling technique. So she didn't create it though, she borrowed it from scientists in South, A South Africa over a hundred years ago, used the flight zone to describe how wild antelope would flee from their predators. And Temple took it and she made it applicable to livestock. Now the flight zone itself is the forward and reverse, left and right. It is the movement mechanism for animals. And it is utilizing one of their two main motivators and that is the fear motivation. So they, it is getting them to move away from you based on the fear. So, but you don't want to invoke full fear in them. So I always explain that all livestock have a fear meter. So they always have this fear meter and it's always turned on. So and it's what keeps them alive. So when they're just out grazing and hanging out in the pasture and there's no threat around, the fear meter is down at the very bottom. Okay, so it's in what I call the bottom of the green zone. So they don't feel the need to flee, they don't feel threatened, they're just grazing along, but it's on and it's alert and they're watching around them. Somebody or a predator starts to approach them and when they come within through their range of vision and they sense them, often their heads pop up. So when their heads pop up, this fear meter just begins up to move up a little in the green. So they're not scared, but they wanna be aware. So head goes up, they're watching you now. 
but they don't feel they need to move away. The predator or the person is far enough away that they don't feel that they're a threat yet. If you want to know who your flightiest animal is in your flock, quite often it's the first animal that pops their head up when you're heading across the field. So who's ever, and it's usually consistently the same one, will pop their head up. Um, and then everybody else starts to pop their head up to watch you. So as you continue to approach them, the fear meter increases up to the green. And then you're gonna hit a certain point where it crosses for green over into yellow, over into the cautionary area. The animals will make a cautionary decision to move away from you at this point. And that is what you want. You do not want them to flee. You want them to just move away quietly. So they are basically reacting to you and have made the decision as a cautionary movement, they are just gonna start moving away from the predator. That is the flight zone. Once you step over that line, and it truly is only a matter of one step, so you're walking towards them, you take a one step and they turn and start moving away from you, you've entered their flight zone. You don't wanna go any closer than that. So they turn and they'll usually start moving as a flock. You need to stay that distance away from them or you can even back off a little and relieve a little pressure from them and they will just keep moving. If they stop, then you need to step back into that flight zone and get them moving again. Now what happens when you go in, I always say, my kids and I always say, you're going too hot. So when you go in too hard and too fast and too far, that fear meter moves up and it travels right through the cautionary level, uh, cautionary color, and it hits red. And that is flee. And that's when they turn around and take off on you because now you've invoked full, full fear in them. And that's not what you want them to do. Okay, so that is the reason you don't go in. That is also when they go through fences, they go through gates, um, they can pile up on you, they can turn back. It's because you've gone in too far, you've got past the comfort zone with them and now they are scared and you don't ever wanna invoke that. So um, the flight zone itself is a reaction to visual pressure, which means they have to be able to see you. Okay. They do not move away because you're yelling at them. So that doesn't, it makes us feel better to yell, but it doesn't make them. So it is actually a reaction to visual pressure. Now here's a diagram of the flight zone. So the edge of the flight zone is all around them. So the flight zone is actually anywhere within their line of vision. So it can be off to the side of them. It can also be above them. So anywhere you can see uh, with cattle, that's why uh, catwalks work so well on single file shoots to move them up and down because they do have a line of vision above them and you can apply pressure from above. So anywhere that an animal can see is their line of vision. Now, most animals have a blind spot in the very back, like you can see in this, this gray triangle behind them. And like I said earlier, animals that have heavy wool around their head will also have a blind spot. And you may have to get way, way out to the side for them to be able to see you. So it's all gonna be depend on your animal and the wool, wool cover on their head, and even somewhat how much wool they have on them, how fluffy they are, um, on where they can see you. So you need to determine that spot. Now the black triangular shape there, that's the position usually in the area you wanna be. So you wanna be a little off to the side so they can see you around their hip area. Now the other important part of the flight zone is actually the shoulder. This is called or referred to as the point of balance. When you're behind the shoulders, the animals will move forward. When you're in front of the shoulders, it normally causes the animals to move backwards. And it also has to do with their vision and where it changes over here. So behind the shoulders, they go forward. In front of the shoulders, they go backwards. Okay, so as you're getting an animal to move, you need to keep moving along with them. And once you experience this and really watch them, and watch how they react in their shoulder area, once, once again, it, it's a matter of a step or a slight movement can change their movement also. But you need to become aware of where your position, positioning with your sheep influences movement. So it's very much being aware of you and being aware of them. So this is how we communicate to them because they don't have verbal understanding of that we need them to move and that we're telling them to do that. So it's quite often your position, how far you're in, how close you get, 
and if they can see you, that impacts their movement. So you need to be aware of this at all times of where you're standing. And so next time you ask yourself, why did they just do that? Take a look at where you're standing, what you might have communicated to them to do. So this is just a picture here about going in too far. You don't want them to flee from you. So you don't want to go in too far or too fast. So make sure you ride that edge and be very quiet when you're handling the animals there. Uh, the top picture shows you the point of balance also. So as she passes by the shoulders of the animals, they move forward. So in an alley situation like this at the top photo, if you want your animals to move forward, you actually go backwards. So you go against their flow of traffic. So as you move down the alleyway in the opposite direction of where you want them to go, they will start to move up the alleyway. Now, if she was to turn around and start moving up the alleyway, the animals would turn around most likely and go back. So it's utilizing that point of balance. The one thing about sheep, people always say move sheep at their natural walking pace. Sheep's natural walking pace in handling is normally running. Uh, they do tend to jog or run. Um, and it's not because the handler is doing anything wrong. It is kind of a sheep thing that they, they don't always just white, walk quietly like cattle do. So as long as they're not startled, but sheep will, I, I give that and I try to explain to people that just because the animals are running isn't because somebody scared them, it's just kind of a sheep thing to do as they tend to move a quicker uh, than the other animals do. And this bottom picture is probably one of the more challenging things is when we work and you see it at auction marts and farms, and this is actually our place, uh, our alleyways often put us behind the animals in their blind spot. Uh, and it makes them very difficult to move. And that's why I'm going to talk about here in a minute, working animals in a smaller group in cases like that. But it is very challenging just the way we design our facilities at time that places the handler in the animal's blind spot right behind them. So now the size of the flight zone can be affected by a lot of things. So and I can't tell you, like, the flight zone on a sheep is 10 feet. You get within 10 feet, you've entered the flight zone. So some animals have no flight zone. Some animals have huge flight zones, like half a mile away. Some animals, like bottle babies, we have two ewes that were bottle babies, and I, they drive me nuts. You can get right up to them, but they're usually right up to you before you ride up to them. So what affects the size of the flight zone? Amount of contact with people. The more contact that animals have with people, the smaller the flight zone they are, they have. So the more they're around people, the closer people can normally get to them. Animals that do not have a lot of contact with people, like they're put out on passion, they see somebody you know, in close vicinity once you know, a month or something, they are not going to have, um, they're gonna have a much bigger flight zone. Uh, amount of contact show animals, 4-H animals that have an increased amount of contact often will have a smaller flight zone because of that. Milk animals, so any animals that are milked daily are exactly the same way. That applies to dairy cows and it can go to dairy sheep too, but the dairy animals that every single day interact up close and personal with uh, handlers have a very small flight zone and it makes them extremely challenging to move. Animals without a flight zone and I used to talk about our bottle babies, are very difficult animals to move because they won't move away from you like you want them to. Quality of human contact. Uh, if animals are not handled quietly, if they have rough handling and very negative experiences, they're going to have a great big flight zone. If they have quiet handlers who handle them in a quiet, calm manner, they're actually going to have a smaller flight zone. Uh, when I sit at slaughter plants with um, cattle, I can usually tell how the animals are handled back at the feedlot. And you ask any of the guys who work in uh, unloading there at the plants, and they will tell you that there are feedlots that have animals. They know exactly how they're handled, and they'll get another feedlot, and animals will be quiet as can be. So you can really pick that up. Genetics play into it. There are genetics that um, are higher strung than others. So we have breeds that are higher strung than others. There's been all kinds of cool research done on this. Uh, Dairy cattle, the more white they have on their head, the higher strung they tend to be. The more black they have on the head, the quieter they tend to be. The finer boned animals are higher strung than the big boned animals. Uh, they even found like Temple did some research, Dr. Grandin, with hair whorls in cattle. And when they have the curly Q hair thing on their forehead, 
uh, when it's high on their head, they tend to be higher strung than when the ones that are low on their head. Uh, on the cattle side of things, so they've done way more research there than in sheep, the English breed cattle that have a lot of back fat who tend to deposit a lot of back fat are quieter than the European continentals who do not put on as much back fat. So genetics do play into it. Once again, they also have not done this on the sheep side, but on the cattle side, um, disposition is most heavily influenced genetically by the bull, but the cow teaches them to be crazy. So the male, at least with cattle, actually influences the disposition of the animal genetically and the mother influences it environmentally. So familiarity, they're gonna have a smaller flight zone when they're at home than when they're at, the, at an auction mark. They're gonna have a smaller flight zone for their owner than they are them for a stranger coming in. Offspring, they will have um, a, you probably can't get as close to them when they have a baby as you can when they don't. So they become protective also. And just the current environment of what's going on. If they've been harassed by predators, uh, if they get scared during processing, if there's a storm, believe it or not, weather plays into it. So there's all kinds of things that play in that affects the size of their flight zone. So it's, it's a constantly changing thing. So now what are the most common mistakes that I see handlers make? Number one, going in too deep to the flight zone, which I showed you a picture of earlier. People get in too close, um, causing the animals to flee and panic. So you need to just barely penetrate it just so they make that cautionary movement away instead of going in too deep. So you don't want to get too close to them. Exhib exhibiting too much predatory behavior. You act like a predator. You move rapidly. You wave your arms. You go in too close. They perceive you as a predator. The less predator behavior you show, the quieter your animals will be for you. The more predator behavior you exhibit, the higher strung they will be and the more fearful they will be because they view you more as a predator and need to protect themselves. Moving too many animals at one time. Um, you need, and I'm gonna show you a slide here in a minute, I'm gonna talk about having control of the animals, but quite often people try to move too many animals at one time. I always tell people if they're all moving, let them go. But if animals start balking and you've got a group of like 60 there, break them into a smaller group and try to move them in a smaller group. You cannot control your lead animal when there's 50 other animals between you and the lead animal. Now, if they're all moving, leave them, do not stop. But what often I'll do is if people are having problems, one of the troubleshooting is bring them into smaller groups. In the hog industry, they've actually done research on loading and you can load two to four pigs. So if you were, they're loaded a trailer with 185 pigs, they were able to load that trailer faster, only loading two to four pigs at a time versus six to 12 pigs at a time. They got it done quicker loading them in the smaller groups and loading them in the bigger groups. So, trying to control flock movement by the animals at the back. So this is where, this is probably one of the biggest mistakes. We always try to push from the back. We always try to control the animal at the back. The animal at the back has 20 other animals in front of it and that is not your flock movement. You need to control your lead animal because once your lead animal starts going, then everybody else follows. But we always have people at the back trying to make the back ones go when the front ones aren't moving. So the key is to get control of the front of your, your front animals and get them going. And once they start moving, then your entire flock goes. But everybody starts at the back. And I think it's because with people, that's how we move people. If we're in a crowd and we're trying to get into some place and we're at the back, we're like shoving and shoving and shoving and pushing. Well, those people can't move because of everybody. Okay, so but we tend to move animals that way. We always want to push them, but it's how we move people. I always tell people, I'll see animals lined up or, or there's a gate or you got an animal at the back, whatever it happens to be, and they're at the very back of the single file and they're trying to get that last animal to go. And there's six animals in front of them. So if you've ever been parked at a stoplight and there's two cars in front of you and the guy behind you starts honking, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you all have the same thought I do about the guy behind me because I can't move forward, so quit honking at me. I will move as soon as the other cars start to move out of the way. This is exactly what your sheep think when you are trying to push those back animals, but the ones in front of them aren't moving. And trying to rush movement. 
So we're trying to get things done too quick. So when you try to rush movement, you're going to have problems. That's when animals, and that's when we tend to go in too deep, too fast, and we get very impatient. So don't try to rush movement. Let them move on their own. If you've got stragglers, don't go back with the stragglers either. The stragglers will come around. I always ignore my stragglers. I used to have to chase everybody down and try to get everybody as a group. If I've moved in 10 animals and one or two goes back, I ignore those one or two because 99% of the time they come around on their own. They'll stop, turn around, see where their flock's coming, and they come right up by me and gather with their flock. So just get the main core group moving, and most of the time everybody else will come along. So how do we minimize predatory traits? We don't want to do yelling. We don't want to do rapid movement. Anything that moves rapidly is normally a predator. The more rapidly something moves, the more of a predator it is in their mind. It's even more scary. Not even just people, but I have a picture of, um, it's from my cattle presentation, but it's a curtain that's blowing out a 4-H show. And all the animals that walk by it would kind of like balk or they kind of startle and go around it and look at it. And it was a scary curtain. I told them to turn the fan off. The curtain quit moving. And none of the animals that walked by it afterwards even noticed the curtain. So it's that rapid movement of anything that puts them on alert. You do not want to strike them. You do not want to crowd them. And you do not want to get in too close. So by minimizing these five things, it minimizes the level of a predator you are to them and makes them easy to work with. Crowding animals. Um, this is really hard to prevent, but you got to do your best. So um, you don't want to just shove and crowd them into a trailer. You want to control them. And this is where moving them in smaller groups can have, help also. But this is a, one of the areas where animals get bruised is gloating into trailers when they jam up at the door. So, and like I was saying, you cannot control flock movement from the back of the flock. You need to control with your lead animals. So your lead animals are your, your main concern. Don't focus so much on the back animals. And the back animals aren't going to want to push either. They usually go up over the top of them and stuff. So it's that back movement. And that's why you want to work in smaller groups. So uh, it's much easier to work them in smaller groups. If the animals also take out, which sheep will do at times, everybody will just go, let them go. But if you're having problems with them, break them into smaller groups and start working them in smaller groups. So a uh, minimum five, six head normally. Um, sheep won't want to be, don't break them down into groups of two, like I told you with the pigs, because those two are going to want to go back with everybody. But just bring them down into it. It's a troubleshooting. If you can't get animals through an alleyway like this one, and you can see there's animals left behind, just bring them through in the smaller groups. And this works really well if you're loading tubs and into alleyways and stuff, is to work them in smaller groups where you can control. About not being in a rush. Um, if you have 15 minutes to move sheep, it'll take you an hour. If you have an hour to move sheep, it'll take you 15 minutes. So um, always give them have enough time for the job because when you're in a hurry, they're not going to cooperate. Same as your kids. So always remember, I love this picture. This is the coolest picture because this animal sees the depth, the drop in the trailer and the shadow. When working in animals, always make sure you have enough time for the task. Whoops. There we go. Don't intentionally run them. Always uh, allow them time to check out their surroundings and let them make the choice to go, especially when loading sheep up into a trailer. Quite often, if you just give them a wee bit, even 10, 15 seconds, they'll jump up on their own. I always run into my 4-H families that the sheep stops just to, I mean, it's a jump up, and then they just start shoving right away. It's like, just give them a minute to make the decision on their own. And sheep must never be kicked, struck, slammed by, or into gates injured by handling equipment or facilities or intentionally abused in any way during handling. There will be times you can't move your animals and you're having problems with them and you're losing your patience and they're not getting anywhere. I always tell people the best thing you can do is give you and yourself, the animal, a five minute break, walk away, take a deep breath and come back. Quite often when you come back, they'll probably be where you were trying to get them in the first place, but they made the decision on their own. Just a few slides on handling aids. Their wool is not a handling tool. So do not grab them by the wool. Uh, the leading cause of carcass damage in sheep is actually wool pulling. And you can see on this one, there's a big white uh, red mark up on its, its hind end there, and there's a red mark by the tag down on its neck. When it was being unloaded, the driver grabbed a handful of wool on its butt and a handful of wool on its neck and drug it off the trailer, kind of lifted and tossed it off the trailer, and this is what it did. But this is the leading cause of carcass damage. 
electric prods are not effective on sheep and you're not allowed to use them on sheep in Canada. So, and dogs. Okay, so if you've got a good dog, the dog will do the work of 10 men. If you don't have a good dog, yeah, he causes you more problems than anything. So if you have a working stock dog, make sure that dog is well trained because there is nothing worse than a bad dog when you're trying to work animals. Couple things on facilities to make life easier. Um, sheep are very sensitive to the contrast between light and dark. Animals or livestock, their eyes actually take longer to adjust, like going into a dark space like this, where we experience temporary blindness, the same as they do. They actually experience it longer than we do. But once their eyes adjust, they can actually see better than we can. Uh, a simple thing as a light bulb above the door to where the transition between light and dark isn't so bad can fix things like this. You want to design your facilities in a manner that sheep are able to maintain visual contact with the animals ahead of them as much as possible because that is that herd instinct and flock movement that you get with sheep, but they need to be able to see each other. All of these things are distractions. We've already talked about shadows in the top photo there. That will cause animals to balk. Um, garbage on the ground, uh, things hanging on your panels, things leaned up against your alleyway and, and water. So, these are some of these things we can control, some of these things we don't have control over, but we need to understand that when they're present, they're actually gonna cause handling issues. And don't overcrowd the tubs. You should never overcrowd tubs. And I know, I don't know why we call them crowd tubs because we don't wanna crowd animals in them. That's the worst thing you can do is crowd them. A lot of people just keep pushing the gates up and up and up on the animals. You need to back the gate off if they're not moving, give them room and they'll usually move around and then turn around and go. But it's the worst thing we do is we overcrowd these things. I'm just gonna go through a few slides and just highlight some things. There's quite a bit on these slides. A lot of times people don't deal with handling your rams and what do you do with your rams? So they're a little different. Uh, rule number one, bottle raised rams will grow up to be aggressive, dangerous rams. So I highly suggest if you have a bottle baby that's a male, it should not be a ram that you keep. You need to castrate it. So, but they will grow up to be quite aggressive. Uh, they must never butt or paw for attention, uh, pressing their head against you or push another sheep out of way in order to dominate attention. So you don't want spoiled sheep rams. I always say that animals must have manners. Now, show animals must have manners. Horses must have manners. Rams must have manners. We demand it here. So we actually shipped a really good ram. We one up from the States. He did not have manners at all. We had a lot of problems with him, and I finally just shipped him because he was causing us way too many problems. So they need to have manners. And a lot of times you teach them that manners. And when you get them when they're older, they might not have been taught those manners. And some of them just don't learn it. So they shouldn't live alone um this can cause behavior problems with them if they are alone uh don't pin them on the top of the head this is considered a challenge when they fight they fight head to head so uh ram should always be chin up you don't want him buddy you don't want their head down and don't stri strike a ram he may consider this um provocation and you hit them on the head he's going to try to hit you back so it is how rams challenge each other so you don't want to do that uh, ram must never approach a human with his head down Usually when I'm training mine, I'll usually yell at him. So um, he must never back up or feign a charge either. So you really need to be aware of that. When they're lambs, do not allow jumping on people. They should always be pushed down. Um, they need to know your space. It goes back to having uh, manners around you and always be aware of what your ram's doing. Um, no matter how quiet he's been, you should always be aware of him because they can turn on you. So to exert dominance over them, roll them over on their butt and back so you can, and that does exert dominance. And ram shields do work. We have tried ram shields before. We Our one problem ram, uh, after we brought him in from breeding, he was always bad, but we put a ram shield on him and it, it does work. So um, here's just, those are similar. Whoops, those are all duplicate other than, um, Breeding season, never use just a single fence to separate rams from ewes or other rams. They will go through it. We actually put up two by sixes for our one ram and we had them doubled. So we had one on each side of the post and that ram went through both of them. So never ever underestimate what they can do when they want to. So, um, 
in off season spacing separating ramps and use um, can only be a time but when they're they're in um, heat when the user uh, cycling and stuff that is when you have uh, your biggest issues so you need to be very aware of them but it's amazing what the rams can do to your fence so and with that i think i'm right on time robin thanks jennifer uh yeah so we have about 10 minutes left if there are any questions i'm going to give people a couple minutes here to process and type their questions in i don't have any questions docked in the queue right now so this is a good opportunity if anybody has some questions type them in and we have a few minutes for jennifer to answer them While people are, um, if we got any questions and stuff, just back on the rams. Um, they really are one animal that is overlooked on, on handling and behavior and stuff. And, and producers do need to spend a lot of time in there and teaching them the manners and stuff because they can get quite dangerous uh, with them. But it seems to be the one area um, people never, never look at. And I see it a lot with 4-H animals too, all the species groups, but a lot of it is how people need to be very aware of handling them. And like I've, I've just said, but I'm going to repeat it again, you know, it's, it's how you pet them and scratching them on the head and, and allowing them to bud or allowing them to paw for attention. You can expect manners out of your animals the same way that you do out of your children. So, and you need to do it in a non-abusive manner. I don't want you sitting there like, hitting them everything they do it but they need to learn what that space is they need to learn what that personal space is they do not come up and put their heads in buckets and but you need to teach that but they their personalities can change greatly um, during breeding season so um, and that is when you do have the biggest problems with them and trying to get them away from girls and stuff and when you introduce new rams um, always be aware of of watching them too, because they will put a thumping on the new guy pretty good. If you can mix two and it's usually a little better. So, but all of these things are on this list here, they're, they're repetitive, but they're things people need to remember on how you teach them to have manners. And a lot of us don't teach our rams to have manners. I love a well-mannered lamb. So a well-mannered lamb also lets the ewes go up and eat first. He'll sit back and let his girls go up and eat. So. But uh, bottle raised ones and raising them by themselves is not good. If you only have one ram, and I know some people do, my husband calls me a ram hoarder. I have more rams than I need. Um, but uh, get it a goat, get it another animal, get it a weather, whatever it happens to be. But you should, your ram should not be raised alone. It needs to have something else in with it. So. Okay, well, um, nobody has any questions for you today, Jennifer. You get off easy, and it was obviously a really thorough presentation. So I just want to take uh, the time here to th thank you so much for joining us on uh, on Wednesday morning. And uh, and yeah, I guess we'll we'll end the webinar now. And uh, you can see there's Jennifer's website uh, for more information. And I guess should you have any further questions. So thanks again, Jennifer. Feel free to get a hold of me with anything on handling or behavior problems, facilities, anything. Happy to help. Perfect. Thanks so much and have a great day, everyone.